Introduction into Mitochondrial Diseases in Adulthood, organized by UNMD in partnership with European Academy of Neurology and ERN R&D for Rare Neurological Diseases. Thank you to our today's speaker, Professor Cornelia Kornblum, for taking the time to present this webinar to us. Cornelia Kornblum is an Associate Professor of Neurology at the Department of Neurology, University Hospital of Bonn in Germany. She heads the neuromuscular diseases section, including a specialized clinical trial unit and neuromuscular laboratory. Today, uh, Cornelia Kornblum will introduce us to several topics into mitochondrial diseases in adulthood. Thank you again, Cornelia, um, for your presentation and the floor is yours. Okay, yes, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Thanks a lot, Antonio. Thanks to the organizing team. Dear colleagues, dear all, yes, a very warm welcome now to our today's uh, teaching webinar on mitochondrial diseases in adulthood. In the next uh, hour or so, I would like to give you an introduction into the topics. So we will focus on genetic and biochemical background of mitochondrial diseases, on disease-associated molecular genetic findings, on basic diagnostic methods, on basis treatment concepts, and we will discuss uh, various ways of classifying mitochondrial diseases. And also, uh, finally, I will, I will present you some selected uh, clinical syndromes. Mitochondrial disorders are some of the most common inherited neurometabolic disorders. They are complex neurogenetic conditions that present clinical and diagnostic and especially treatment challenges for physicians and for, for us as uh, neurologists. The, the molecular genetic background is very special in mitochondrial diseases because uh, the diseases may be due to primary mitochondrial uh, DNA mutations, mtDNA mutations, the abbreviation, or on primary nuclear uh, DNA mutations, mutations meaning here uh, pathogenic sequence variants. The minimal prevalence that are the latest uh, numbers here is uh, almost 70 in 100,000, which refers to the estimated lifetime risk for disease manifestation. Primary mitochondrial DNA mutations have a, a prevalence of around 20, 20.4 in 100,000, and uh, primary nuclear DNA mutations have a prevalence of 48.4 uh, in 100,000, uh, referring to just recessive uh, disorders and uh, disorders in, in Europe. These are data from, from Europe and from, from, from the UK. So in total, there are one in 1,470 newborns at risk of developing a mitochondrial disease over time. So the, the mitochondrial disorders are rare disorders, but when you look at them in, in general, in total, they are not, not rare uh, at all because it's a very broad spectrum of diseases. So in its most narrow definition, these disorders are clinical syndromes that are associated with a primary dysfunction of the respiratory chain, meaning they are characterized by a respiratory chain enzyme deficiency. They are uh, frequently multisystemic, multi-organ disorders, but usually are uh, very frequently involved to, to came to rely on the incorporated prokaryote for energy production. And this is a so-called endosymbiotic hypothesis. And it's vice versa that the, 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 uh, the, the host, uh, the, ho the, the prokaryote, the incorporated, uh, came to rely on the, the host cell for, let's say, protein production, so on. So there's a very tight communication network between mitochondria and the nucleus. And the mitochondrial um, biogenesis and transcription is uh, very well controlled by the, by the nucleus. And most mitochondrial proteins are indeed encoded by, by nuclear genes. So the nuclear, there is a nuclear mitochondrial intergenomic um, communication. 
my major mitochondrial functions um, are uh, energy production. This is a major function. They, uh, mitochondria have multiple very essential cellular functions, but the fundamental role is the cell, cellular energy production. That, so they are also called um, powerhouse of the cell. So they, um, apart from oxidative phosphorylation, which is located at the highly folded inner mitochondrial membrane, there are the, the, uh, the uh, respiratory chain is localized, the electron transport chain. Beside that, um, we, uh, the, the fatty acid oxidation um, uh, is located in the mitochondrial matrix, as is the, the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, the TCA um, uh, cycle, which is also located in the mitochondrial matrix. So um, we have different ways of energy production, different metabolic pathways, but the, the, the most important uh, might be the, uh, the oxidative phosphorylation when it comes to mitochondrial diseases. So here we see a table uh, showing uh, the respiratory uh, chain enzyme complexes. There are four complexes, complex one to complex four and uh, the ATP synthase, it's called complex five also, where ATP, um, uh, um, where, where ATP is synthesized. It is, it is very important for mitochondrial diseases to say that all but complex two, uh, all of these complexes, but, uh, but apart from uh, complex two are encoded by mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. Um, subunits by my so just complex two, which is also called succinate dehydrogenase, is is, is built of uh, nuclear DNA encoded proteins. So there's no mitochondrial DNA uh, involved here in complex two. All the other complexes have have, have both DNAs involved, and if, to better understand. Um, I, I would, um, would uh, like to say that complex four is also called COX or cytochrome C oxidase. It's synonymous. That is very important for, for understanding. So here we see a figure of the electron transport chain. Uh, this uh, transport chain is the site of oxidative phosphorylation in eukaryotes. So you see uh, uh, the, the inner outer membrane and the matrix inside and the intermembrane space. And electrons are passed from one protein complex of the transport chain to another in a series of redox reactions. And um, energy released in these reactions is captured as a protein gradient over the inner mitochondrial membrane. So proteins are pumped into the intermembrane space. And then this energy is used to make ATP in a process called chemiosmosis at complex five or ATP synthase. So there the, the electrons, um, uh, the, the, the protons flow so back and, and, um, and ATP is uh, synthesized. Uh, these processes, the transport chain and this chemiosmosis process uh, all together make up uh, the oxidative uh, phosphorylation. And for sure, as the, 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 as the name uh, uh, says, it's uh, uh, oxygen is uh, consumed via this process. Now let's uh, go to the mitochondrial DNA, which is a, which is a, a small circular double-stranded DNA molecule, uh, and it consists of 16,569 base pairs. Here you see a figure um, showing this mitochondrial DNA. And um, there are, that is very important for understanding, up to 10 circular mitochondrial DNA molecules per, per, per mitochondrion. So each cell contains multiple copies of mitochondrial DNA, which is called polyplasmy. And depending on the number of mitochondria um, in, in cells, there may be up to 100,000 mitochondrial DNA copies per cell. This depends on cell types and highest numbers are seen in mitochondria-rich tissues uh, like oocytes, 
and scuttle muscle fibers, brain, etc. And those are usually tissues with highest uh, energy uh, demands. The mitochondrial genome consists of 37 genes and encodes seven subunits uh, of complex one. Uh, one subunit of a complex F3, it's a cytochrome B, three subunits of complex 4, these COX subunit, COX 1 to 3 genes, mitochondrial genes, two subunits of complex 5, it's ATP 6 and ATP 8, two uh, RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and 22 mitochondrial tRNAs. So mitochondria are considered heteroplasmic. It's a, so it's a, a, there is a heterogeneous population of mitochondrial DNA within the same cell and even within the same mitochondria. And that is important for understanding mitochondrial diseases. This uh, heteroplasmy means um, the presence of wild type and mutated, let's say, Pathogenic, pathogenic in this case, mitochondrial DNA in a mitochondrion or cell or in a tissue. And this degree of heteroplasmy, um, that is a mutation, mutation load. It means a percent of, for example, mutated mitochondrial DNA when we speak of mitochondrial diseases um, that are due to mtDNA mutations. In contrast, homoplasmy means that all copies of mitochondrial DNA molecules are identical. For example, we would see a 100% mutation load, and that is very typical for the disease of Leber, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. Those patients usually harbor 100% pathogenic mitochondrial DNA point mutation in, complexes, uh, in complex one uh, subunits. The biochemical threshold effect is very important for um, manifestation of mitochondrial uh, diseases. So there are very special characteristics of pathogenic mtDNA variants. Um, the, the, the threshold effect means that um, a biochemical manifestation, for example, a COX uh, deficiency, complex four deficiency, occurs when the level of a pathogenic mitochondrial DNA variant exceeds a very specific threshold of mtDNA heteroplasmy, with this threshold varying between tissues and between different mtDNA variants. So different variants may have different thresholds. You can characterize those thresholds, for example, by single fiber analyses. And um, tissue segregation means that uh, there's a variable tissue distribution of mutation loads in pathogenic uh, mitochondrial DNA variants, um, for which higher levels are usually present in post-metotic tissues like skeletal muscle or brain. And in some mitochondrial DNA variants, um, blood levels may even decline um, over time, blood levels meaning mutation loads. That has been shown, for example, for the Miller's uh, mutation, the 3243A2G uh, mttl one mutation. So it depends on how, um, how tissues or cells deal with, uh, with, with the mitochondrial DNA molecules in, in mitosis, for example. Mitophagy plays a role here too. Uh, in contrast, there's a lack of tissue segregation uh, in some pathogenic variants, uh, like in uh, MT80, some MT80P6 variants that are associated with the NARP or Lee syndrome phenotype, maternally inherited Lee syndrome, or for sure um, in homo, uh, homoplasmy, like in Leber, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. And it is important to say that there's a, vari a variation in mitochondrial DNA mutation loads between family members and clinical phenotypes may range from asymptomatic to oligosymptomatic to even full-blown syndromes, like it has been shown, for example, in, in, in Miller syndrome. Here on the right-hand side, you see a figure, figure C showing such a, um, a, a family with very different mutation loads and very different 
um, clinical phenotypes. But it's 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 very important to say that it's not just the the mutation load that characterizes the clinical phenotype. It is very complex, and I have to say it is not fully understood. Um, this very peculiar um, genotype phenotype um, uh, variation in, in in most mitochondrial disorders. Now let's come to mitochondrial DNA mutations in human disease. So with what kind of mutations do we see, do we see frequently see? So there are mitochondrial DNA rearrangements. Here um, we, we uh, very frequently see deletions, meaning single large scale deletions. Um, on the right hand side, you see a figure where you see a common deletion with, the, with, the, with the, the red circle surrounding this part of the mitochondrial circular genome that is missing. Um, a common deletion um, has specific breakpoints and a specific size of uh, 4,977 base pairs. And uh, there are some uh, reasons. Uh, for the specific uh, break points um, that depends on, on uh, replication and um, molecular genetic mechanisms. So this single uh, deletion is uh, frequently uh, leading, resulting in a, in a chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia or current C or phenotype. Um, it may also appear age-related, it's not pathogenic in this case, but much uh, more common uh, are multiple mitochondrial DNA deletions appearing with age. And um, it is very difficult to differentiate um, if multiple deletions are age-related or are due to a primary mitochondrial disorder. So, Apart from single deletions, we can see multiple deletions, um, meaning different breakpoints, different um, parts of the mitochondrial genome missing, different sizes of smaller circles of mitochondrial DNA within one tissue or within one mitochondrion or one cell. So these multiple deletions are usually secondary to pathogenic sequence variants of nuclear mitochondrial genes. You can see them in the so-called mitochondrial DNA um, maintenance disorders. Um, they follow Mendelian patterns of inheritance, which is due to the nuclear uh, uh, gene uh, affection, like dominant or recessive or very rarely um, X-linked. They may also appear sporadic, um, which, uh, which is, is the same for, for the single uh, deletions. Then we uh, also see mitochondrial DNA point mutations, pathogenic point mutations in mitochondrial diseases. They may be maternally inherited, um, usually heteroplasmic, very rarely homoplasmic like in Lieber, and they may affect the mitochondrial protein synthesis in total. Uh, that uh, um, is when they are usually, when they are located in mitochondrial tRNA genes, like the gene MT, standing for mitochondrial uh, TL1, that is a mitochondrially encoded tRNA for leucine, and very typical for Mila's uh, phenotypes. Or for example, MTTK, the mitochondrial encoded tRNA for lysine, uh, associated, usually associated with uh, myoclonus epilepsy with ragged red fibers, the MRF phenotype. Point mutations may also be directly located in mitochondrial protein coding genes, um, affecting uh, mitochondrially encoded uh, subunits. Um, of complex one cytochrome B, uh, complex four COX or MT ATP6 or A genes, usually associated with uh, NARP phenotypes. Uh, it stands for uh, neuropathy, ataxia, and retinitis pigmentosa or maternally inherited Lee syndrome. Here on the right hand side, you see the, the locations of these respective uh, genes. For example, the, the mitochondrial tRNA gene, uh, tRNA genes, MTTL1, MTTK, and uh, its mutations. 
Um, how to diagnose a mitochondrial uh, disease? The respective uh, diagnostic pathway may be very different and highly depends on individual findings like the family history, the phenotype, or even the healthcare system. So um, in blood tests, we, we sometimes see elevations of lactate and CK, but it's not always the case in adult patients. Very recently, mitochondrial biomarkers FGF21 and GDF15 have been identified that uh, may be uh, increased, um, severely increased in, in patients with myopathic phenotypes, especially in patients harboring multiple mtDNA deletions. And uh, we can do neurophysiology, but it's not very specific, EMG and nerve conduction studies, skeletal muscle MRI, with T1 uh, sequences for fatty changes and T2 or stir or spare for edema-like changes or Dixon for quantification um, of fat or water only uh, images. So, but it's not very, very specific in many uh, of these uh, disorders of adulthood. So skeletal muscle biopsy is still one gold standard uh, including enzyme histochemistry and including uh, biochemical analysis of respiratory chain enzymes and uh, side trait synthase activities, CS activities. That is a mitochondrial matrix enzyme and uh, usually um, uh, reflects the mitochondrial mass because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's nuclear uh, encoded. The, Molecular genetic analysis is the second, the other gold standard. Um, and uh, um, it, it's really uh, very important uh, today, um, but we have to be aware that mitochondrial DNA mutations uh, may be tissue specific. And it might be that uh, these mutations can be identified in muscle, for example, only. So depending on the clinical phenotype, uh, one should uh, go for a mitochondrial DNA deletion screening um, by, for example, long range PCR, or southern blood or real time PCR. And um, if you uh, look for um, nuclear DNA mutations, um, NGS, next generation sequence techniques, uh, sequencing techniques uh, should be applied with multi gene panels or even whole exome or um, whole genome sequencing. Very rarely we can go for a se direct sequencing of, of candidate genes. But you have to be careful uh, mitochondrial DNA deletions may be not detected by multi-gene panels applying NGS techniques. So what do we find in a classical characteristic mitochondrial um, uh, disease? Here we see a, a skeletal muscle biopsy of one of our patients with a single uh, deletion with a degree of heteroplasmy of 80%. Uh, you see a modified gummary trichrome stain uh, showing a mitochondrial proliferation appearing here red. Um, these are uh, uh, cross-sectional um, uh, fibers of skeletal muscle. Um, it's the thigh muscle. And we see a ragged red fibers and fibers with, a, um, with a sub rims showing mitochondrial proliferation indicated in red. Below you see a Cox staining, it's enzyme histochemistry complex four, and um, the activity is highly, highly reduced or even absent in fibers that appear very weak and pale here, weakly stained pale, um, almost white. So usually it should be brown. SDH is complex two uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, as, as we um, discussed, is, uh, there is, it's, it's encoded by nuclear DNA only, so um, it's not affected by mtDNA mutations. And here we see the mitochondrial proliferation, which is um, compensatory. Um, we see uh, this here uh, too, it, 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 it's, it's shown in it's blue SDH. If you do a double staining of Cox and SDH, it's let's say normalized to the mass of mitochondria and uh, those fibers appearing um, blue um, uh, are COX deficient 
um, it's 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 stained against the SDH, so it's Cox uh, Cox deficient, but SDH um, um, and positive. So now I would like to show you some very basic treatment concepts and experimental strategies very, very briefly, because there is no cure, unfortunately, to mitochondrial disorders yet. So there is symptomatic management of symptoms and complications, for example, very important anti-epileptic treatment, et cetera. And there are concepts for metabolic and biochemical correction. Currently, there are some clinical trials running um, to increase intracellular mitochondrial mass or to activate mitochondrial biogenesis like um, PPR agonists. Or you can also do exercise training to increase your mitochondrial mass. This NDH booster strategies to increase N NAD, uh, NAD levels. Um, there are concepts to stimulate the mitochondrial turnover, to modulate mitochondrial DNA mutation loads, for example, by, by um, influencing mitophagy, uh, to selectively remove defect mitochondria or mtDNA molecules. There are um, strategies to, uh, for modulation of ROS production, antioxidative therapies to enhance uh, uh, respiratory chain function or to buffer energy. Um, here we summarize adibinone or coenzyme Q10 or creati uh, creatine monohydrate. Um, there are ideas, ideas of correcting uh, mitochondrial DNTP pool imbalances in, in mtDNA maintenance disorders, um, specific disorders that are characterized by a mitochondrial DNA pool imbalance or, or lack of uh, DNTP. Um, it's like uh, enzyme replacement therapy in uh, Minji syndrome. Uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or liver transplantation, we, we, we come to that later, or nucleoside substrate enhancement or nucleotide bypass therapies um, like DNTP treatments in uh, thymidine kinase 2 deficiency. There are clinical trials running in this disorder, usually affecting children, uh, but may appear in adults to currently running clinical trial. Right. Um, there are gene therapy concepts uh, to shift MT uh, DNA mutation heteroplasmy uh, by um, uh, making use of uh, mitochondrially targeted restriction enzymes like TALEN or uh, zinc finger nucleases and nuclear genome editing techniques, all still um, experimental. And there's a risk reduction or prevention therapy for mtDNA associated disorders. It's an, a mitochondrial replacement therapy. You might have heard of that. It's a three parent baby, let's say, technique. It's an IVF technique for mothers affected uh, by serious mtDNA mutations. And this technique uh, requires oocyte donation and um, is at least in the UK, it can be under very special circumstances, it can be used. Mitochondrial disorders in adulthood. The classification is very complex and heterogeneous. You can um, classify according to the clinical syndrome, which is usually done, but you also can classify uh, the, this huge uh, broad spectrum of diseases according to the underlying biochemical defect or to the molecular genetic uh, defect. Uh, at the molecular level, we uh, can uh, we see these pathogenic mitochondrial DNA variants, usually uh, maternally inherited or appearing sporadic. And we uh, see pathogenic nuclear DNA sequence variants. Um, and uh, these uh, group of diseases is really expanding. Um, as you know, we have uh, more than 1,700 mitochondrial proteins and many may be affected uh, due to genetic uh, defects. We see here Mendelian inheritance patterns, sometimes sporadic, uh, like in recessive disorders appearing sporadic. Uh, nuclear mutations um, may directly or indirectly affect the integrity, the mitochondrial integrity, the function or maintenance. And we do see mutations in, the, in genes, nuclear DNA, 
in nuclear genes encoding subunits of the respiratory chain, ancillary proteins are assembly factors of the respiratory chain. In genes affecting mtDNA replication and expression like um, RNA transcription or translation, for example, mutations uh, in genes encoding mitochondrial tRNA synthesis, RNA processing, translation uh, regulation, DNA repair are um, affecting the uh, intramitochondrial nucleotide fuel balance. Uh, genes uh, that are involved in mitochondrial dynamics, homeostasis or quality control may be affected, involved in metabolism of substrates and metabolism of cofactors and metabolism of toxic compounds. Uh, and we have uh, some uh, genes uh, where the function is really not very well known yet. So um, uh, let's step now to very important and very frequent um, mitochondrial disorders, clinical syndromes. Um, I would like to start with syndromes that are traditionally um, due to primary mitochondrial DNA pathogenic variants, but no longer exclusively because uh, we now see uh, uh, nuclear gene mutations also leading to these clinical phenotypes, but it's due to the rapid progress in molecular genetic analyses. So here we have the chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia and the Miller syndrome, mitochondrial encephalomyopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes as very characteristic um, syndromes. And then I would like to introduce you into um, um, characteristic syndromes of, of nuclear uh, uh, genes. It's polk associated diseases. Polk stands for mitochondrial DNA polymerase gamma. And the MINGI, the mitochondrial neurogastrointestinal encephalomyopathy. And there are hundreds of other mitochondrial disorders in adulthood, very frequent too, but I have to, um, to, to focus on those um, due to this uh, introduction and to, for matters of, of time. The CPO, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, sometimes it's called PEO without the C for chronic, um, has been described in, in the late 19th century by a German ophthalmologist. Um, it's uh, it's uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Ernst Albrecht von Gräfe. That's why it has been called Gräfe's disease, formerly at least in, in Germany. And this ophthalmologist was a regular professor at the University of Berlin at that time and was the founder, um, as it said, of the medical discipline ophthalmology in, in Germany. So it is the most frequent mitochondrial disease in adult heart, together with the Lieber, the Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy that is very frequent too, perhaps a bit, uh, even a bit more frequent than the CPO. Uh, usually it is uh, characterized by a sometimes very subtle um, multi-organ affection that it's called CPO plus. And when it is a very severe phenotype uh, and fulfills the criteria, I will show you later, it's, it's called a kern sire syndrome, which is a clinical continuum. Uh, the, disor the disorder is characterized by a very high genotype phenotype variability as are most other mitochondrial disorders. And in more than 50% of patients, uh, we see a single large scale mitochondrial DNA deletion um, that, that uh, results in that clinical phenotype. In uh, kern sire syndrome, it's even more than 90% of patients harboring this very characteristic so-called common deletion with specific breakpoints usually and a specific size. Sometimes it may, the deletion may be located uh, in, in different areas of the genome, but most frequent we find the, the, the common deletion. That's why right, it's called common. So, um, but there may be also nuclear gene mutations leading to this, that phenotype as uh, has been described in the last years in Polk or in Twinkle or RRM2B genes. 
uh, these are maintenance genes resulting in secondary multiple mitochondrial DNA deletions in, in tissues or muscles. But we see also other genes affected uh, like uh, DNA2, SPG7, TK2 and others resulting in instability of the mitochondrial genome. And finally, there may be pathogenic mtDNA point mutations too, resulting to CPO. It starts uh, usually in, with an isolated unilateral upper eyelid ptosis and may um, then affect the second eye over the years. And there's a paresis of extraocular muscles that is uh, uh, chronic, that, that is progressive, slowly progressive. It is a clinical syndrome, but maybe a symptom also of other multisystemic mitochondrial disorders. So it's a, a, a question of definition. Most patients have exercise intolerance and a mild proximal paresis of lower limbs. There may be um, um, axonal uh, peripheral neuropathy, cardiac conduction abnormalities, cardiomyopathy, cerebellar ataxia quite frequent, dysphagia, hearing loss, and neuropsychological deficits usually affecting the, the frontal lobe um, functions. The current Sire syndrome is historically defined as CPO, pigmentary retinopathy, first manifestation at young ages, less younger than 20 years. And one of um, those uh, characteristics described here, it's a cerebellar attacks here, or cardiac conduction defect, or elevated uh, CSF protein concentration. Uh, cachexia is very common in current Sayer syndrome and CPO also. The diagnostic pathway is quite clear. One should look for a, a deletion, uh, best is the skeletal muscle uh, DNA. Um, if we find multiple deletions, we have to look for nuclear genes. If deletion screening is negative, uh, look for mitochondrial tRNA genes or whole mtDNA. If uh, there is a clear maternal mode of inheritance, one could directly go for the mitochondrial tRNA genes. Sometimes they may be detected even in blood or urine. A skeletal muscle might be the best. And if there's a clear autosomal mode of inheritance, directly go for nuclear genes, but then we don't need uh, muscle tissues and you can check blood. Now I would go to the come to the Miller syndrome. Um, Miller's is characterized by stroke-like episodes, usually associated with headache, visual disturbance, epileptic activity, and, and behavioral abnormalities of psychiatric symptoms. There's a European consensus statement showing, say, saying that um, these stroke-like episodes are an subacute sub evolving brain syndrome that is driven by epileptic seizure activity. That very much differs from other, um, uh, let's say, characterizations showing or, or, or hypotheses saying that it's a vascular component or my, mitochondrial microangiopathy. It's a vascular hypothesis. It's not finally resolved, this, this question, but uh, from the clinical point of view, we have to say that seizures are very, very important here. Migraine-like headache, vomiting, disturbed consciousness, uh, confusional states uh, indicate an encephalopathy, epilepsy, as said, is very frequent, cognitive decline and dementia over time, neuropsychiatric symptoms, um, behavioral abnormalities, exercise intolerance, hearing loss, diabetes, short, short stature, cardiomyopathy, gastrointestinal symptoms, and mitochondrial retinopathy are very uh, typical in Miller's or in Miller's overlap syndromes. So the full-blown Miller's uh, is not very frequent. We frequently see parts of this, um, this, uh, this syndrome. Here we see skeletal muscle with a characteristic MTTL1 mutation, the Miller's mutation um, at position 3243A2G in this tRNA. Ragged red fibers, and we usually see Cox uh, negative ragged red fibers, which shows that this mutation has a quite high threshold for biochemical manifestation. Here we see a mitochondrial retinopathy, formerly often described as pigmentary retinopathy. 
uh, we see a hyper autofluorescent flag like lesions uh, of the retina and chorioretinal atrophy, as you can see here, sharply demarked in OCT um, images. We, we just published this, um, this, this paper on mitochondrial retinopathies a couple of, of, of months ago. So red flags for stroke-like episodes are um, atypical clinical presentations, um, but, but uh, is very helpful to differ from ischemic strokes. No vascular risk factors, neuropsychiatric symptoms, symptoms EEG abnormalities, and MRI or neuroimaging abnormalities not confined to vascular territories. So we have focal cerebral lesions with a tendency for spontaneous remission, no clear evidence of ischemia. We see a preference for occipital and temporal lobes. We usually see a march of lesions over time, over days, over days or few, few, few weeks in, in a stroke-like episodes. And in diffusion weighted uh, uh, imaging, uh, MRI imaging, we see uh, that there is an ADC a decrease in, in the cortex and an increase usually in white matter. That's not always like this, but it may be, and that very much differs from a classical ischemic stroke showing a general diffusion restriction in, in an acute, um, um, in, the, in the acute phase. And sometimes we see cortical laminar necrosis over time. So it's perhaps much more a metabolic crisis than a vascular crisis, a stroke-like um, stroke -like episode. And here we see stroke-like lesions um, with the signal hyperintensity and diffusion-weighted imaging, ADC cortical um, decrease, white matter increase in ADC sequences flare. It's flare positive. And uh, very important also that T1 with contrast does not show any enhancement, but differs um, from uh, the, uh, the classical vascular ischemia. This has been performed a couple of days um, after the, the acute manifestation. If you suspect a MELAS, check for this MELAS mutation uh, in MTTL1, what is the most frequent mutation you can check in blood. Skeletal muscle might be better depending on the degree of heteroplasmy. Um, if negative, check for other tRNAs or the whole mtDNA. If ne negative, check for PALK or CoQ8 A, a gene, ADCK3 or other nuclear genes. Anti-epileptic treatment is very important. The use of L-arginine is very controversial because, uh, as, as, as said, it's little evidence. There's little evidence to support the vascular involvement in stroke-like episodes. According to our experience, high-dose corticosteroids, IV in the, in, the, in the acute phase, might be helpful as in, in let's say, migraine with, with uh, aura and severe lactic acidosis. Um, um, should be treated on intensive care units if needed um, when there is a severe metabolic um, acidosis. So I would like uh, now to um, finally come to some nuclear uh, phenotypes, polk associated disorders very briefly because they are so, so heterogeneous ranging from severe infantile encephalomyopathies uh, to cerebellar ataxia, epilepsy syndromes, uh, to late onset CPO mild syndromes. The ALPA syndrome is characterized by a refractory epilepsy, liver disease, psychomotor retardation, Sandoz syndrome, sensory ataxic neuropathy, dysarthria, ophthalmoparesis. The MIRAS is a recessive mitochondrial ataxia syndrome. Uh, the mitochondrial spinal cerebellar ataxia and epilepsy is, is uh, usually due to polyp mutations with occipital, predominant occipital manifestations. And CPO plus phenotypes with highly variable plus uh, symptoms. So these polyp associated disorders um, are, are very, very heterogeneous. Here you see a liver biopsy of a child, I have to say, with an Alpha syndrome showing wide areas of Cox negative um, liver cells in a Cox SDH double staining. 
And on the right hand side, you see a patient who, who unfortunately died uh, in a refractory uh, epileptic status, sh showing this, this MRI signal hyperintensities and the, the EEG um, in, in, uh, that, that are due to, to the epilepsy, we, we think. And finally, um, I would like to, to, to introduce the Minji syndrome to you because it is very important because it is uh, very frequently overseen. It is defined as an ultra rare disorder, but it's not so rare, um, at least we think, because sometimes um, these patients are not seen by, by neurologists because they have serious gastrointestinal symptoms um, that are very predominant, um, like uh, dysmotility, constipation, diarrhea, cachexia, nausea, vomiting, and, and um, sub-occlusive or occlusive uh, episodes. Even gastrointestinal bleeding um, may appear and very um, um, dangerous emergency situations. There is usually very mild external ophthalmoplegia and upper eyelid ptosis can easily be overseen because it's very mild compared to the CPO phenotype, but it's usually, usually there at least in the course of the disease. There's a very characteristic peripheral neuropathy, characteristic because it's a demyelinating neuropathy with very severe um, findings in uh, nerve conduction studies uh, with, with, uh, with characteristic demyelinating uh, picture like um, um, a clon clon a chronic inflammatory uh, neuropathy um, and very discrepant to this ENG findings is the clinic where we usually don't see any signs of neuropathy um, in, the, in, the, in the first years of the disease which is in contrast to the severe ENG findings. That's not uh, fully understood. Only over the time we do see a severe clinical neuropathy. But the ENG is, is very um, pathologic in the very beginning of the disease usually. We see a clinically asymptomatic leukoencephalopathy, as you see here on MRI um, uh, picture of one of our patients. The disease is due to um, recessive uh, pathogenic sequence variants uh, in the thymidine phosphorylase uh, gene, and it's a nuclear mitochondrial gene and um, resulting in a thymidine phosphorylase deficiency. This enzyme catabolizes thymidine and deoxyuridin into thymine and uracil. And so these um, um, uh, thymidine and deoxyuridin accumulate. They may be a toxic. Um, they result in an, this results in an imbalance of the intramitochondrial nucleotide pool and thus in, in disturbed replication of mitochondrial DNA, um, resulting then in multiple deletions, not in depletion, but in uh, deletions. And accumulation of these multiple de deletions. Uh, finally resides in the biochemical and in the, the clinical phenotype. So it's a disorder of mitochondrial um, uh, DNA maintenance and, and integrity. Uh, if you suspect uh, uh, such a syndrome, you may uh, do um, uh, biochemical analyses. Uh, much easier and faster is uh, a genetic analysis of this, and, uh, this gene, the thymidine phosphorylase gene in blood. If you don't find pathogenic mutations, look for other nuclear genes like MGME1 or RRM2B or POLK. They may imitate this um, MNG phenotype. And if you don't find anything, then look for mtDNA deletions in, in muscle, perhaps it's a new gene or whatever. Um, there are, there's no cure yet, some treatment options, um, but um, very limited, I have to say. Um, there's hemodialysis or um, peritoneal dialysis or platelet infusion to, for temporary improvement of biochemical imbalance with very practical limitations and unclear clinical effects. 
there's erythrocyte uh, encapsulated enzyme replacement therapy that has been applied to patients uh, already might be effective. It's currently under clinical evaluation, but it's, uh, there are very practical limitations here too and unclear long-term effects. Uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, has been used, but there's a very high morbidity and mortality. Um, liver transplantation orthotopic has been used in single case reports, but with unclear neurological outcome. And um, gene therapy um, with liver target um, is still experimental, either AAV mediated gene transfer therapy or lentiviral vector based um, autologous hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy. Um, both techniques have been uh, applied in, in, in uh, animal models and mouse uh, models. And there's a big hope for this gene therapy because it's a, a monogenetic, uh, very severe uh, disease. So uh, let's see if, if there be, will be some um, um, studies on, on this in the, in the, in the future. So what I would like to 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 end um, to finish uh, now with the with the with the introduction of Mito MitoNet to you. It's a my a, a network, a translation oriented collaborative uh, project in the field of rare diseases here in Germany, but not just in Germany because there is a patient registry, Mito registry. Um, that, that is available for patients here in Germany, but also in other European countries. Um, it's called GenoMIT. So we harmonized core data sets um, of uh, our registry with, with other mitochondrial disease registries in the uh, European Union, UK, or in the Un United States of America. And so um, um, this, this uh, mito registry it goes European or goes global, uh, we hope at least. And there are already more than 1,800 uh, baseline visits of patients in the German registry. And altogether with the countries named, there will be more than 6,000 um, patients. And um, this regi registry has been developed in close collaboration with, with mitochondrial patient um, organizations. And there's a mitochondrial working group for sure of the European um, uh, reference network, EURNMB. And uh, now I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to, to any to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. Uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, you usually do, <laughs> uh, so it's not unexpected. Uh, we don't have at the moment anyone with questions in Q&A, uh, but uh, I'm going to put questions inevitably. Uh, oh, we just have one now. Uh, so uh, Sabine Rudnik uh, is asking, does rhabdomyolysis play a role in, um, in MELAS? What, in MELAS? Yes, in MELAS. Rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis or? Yes. Ah, okay. Yes, it's not very typical for Mila's mm -hmm. rhabdomyolysis. It's not very typical. Uh, rhabdomyolysis may appear in, in, uh, in, in any, let's say, mitochondrial disorder with skeletal muscle um, manifestation, but uh, it's, it's not very typical in, in these syndromes. Okay, uh, Sabine, uh, you have the possibility of opening your microphone if you have any further comment or doubt. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And I uh, in, in, indeed have a patient who has uh, repeated um, rhabdomyolysis mm -hmm. episodes and has only recently had her diagnosis of Mellor syndrome. Ah, interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, are, we are wondering uh, whether we can offer her a specific treatment in a way to uh, avoid situations like she repeatedly had, um, uh, because she really suffers from severe vomiting. And then this, in these periods, she's had her rhabdomyolysis ah, okay. episodes. And I've never seen that in the literature. And therefore, yeah. I thought, ask the, ask the expert. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, yes, as, as I said, it's not very frequent. I, we, we haven't experienced that. It's usually it's in other mitochondrial diseases with uh, ETFTH or so, uh, where we see this rhabdomyolysis phenotypes. Uh, I think it's very difficult. I mean, it's a really therapeutic challenge with these um, Miller's uh, stroke like or whatever metabolic crisis. So um, you can try some vitamin cocktail or so. There are some positive feedbacks from, from patients, especially coming from neuropediatricians. Um, there, it, it might be uh, like um, um, uh, you, you can use riboflavin or so in, together with coenzyme Q, but it's all, there's no evidence on mm. this. So it's a, perhaps it's a bit like a trial and error. Mm. You know, and um, I, I don't have a, a recipe, let's say, to, to stabilize. I, we, we, we have these patients with these serious um, stroke-like episodes recurrent, and we, we don't have real, um, you know, not, not a really good strategy to, to prevent these um, episodes. And it's obviously the same with this rhabdomyolysis episodes. I would try with some vitamin or so cocktails in a, in a trial and error way. Okay. No, this is not very much. Thank you very much. No, I'm, Thank I'm you. sorry. Yeah? I'm sorry. <laughs> if you si find something, tell us. Yes. <laughs> Selvia Swarush, you can unmute yourself and put your question. Otherwise, I can read it. Sylvia Swarush. Okay, Selvia has. Okay. Can I stop my presentation, Antonio, then it's better. Or? That's as you wish, Cornelia. You can stop sharing. Yes. Celia yeah, okay. uh, Suarez has asked some in NGS platforms offer sequencing plus CNV screening of nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Uh, do you have any experience using these platforms as a first tier test? Okay, so I'm I'm not a molecular geneticist, so we should perhaps ask. Uh, Sabine Rutnik or so. Yes, there, there, yeah, there are uh, companies and there are institutes um, that uh, are able to, uh, to, to look for the mitochondrial DNA um, in, uh, in, in parallel um, to nuclear genes with the next generation sequencing whole genome, uh, whole, whole exome strategies. It should, it, it works obviously because the mitochondrial DNA is, you know, it's, uh, um, it is, it is multiple, there are multiple copies per nuclear genome, so it should work, but I think it's a method, a, a matter of enrichment, to how to enrich and of technical questions, and as far as I understand, the institute or the, the, the geneticists have to know that they have to look for the mitochondrial DNA too, so then you can uh, do both with one exome um, sequencing uh, analyses. That's what what I understand. Okay, so you have a question for the registry. I think it's the Mito uh, registry. So asking how you can contribute to the registry and join the group. Mm -hmm. the, the registry. There are uh, centers that are affiliated with the MitoNet. And partners of MitoNet um, can can include patients into this registry. So um, it's it's not a registry where the patients can uh, let's say in, in in can be included by themselves or so. Um, so the the physician has to do it, and there are there is a home page, and you can the registry is coordinated Munich and affiliated partners of MitoNet. Um, they, they can include patients into the registry. It's a quite um, a long process because it's a very detailed registry, I have to say. So it's a very, there is a lot of information inside this registry. Rio Bromir Mavamov asks if you know of any specific anti-epileptic protocols for MILAs. Uh, yeah, there are some um, anti-epileptic uh, drugs that uh, should uh, that work best and are best tolerated in in Milas, and so it's um, it's levetiracetam. That's that's very uh, very useful. 
um, because it works against myoclony too. The same is for the myoclonus epilepsy with ragged red fibers. And uh, there is um, Zonizamid, Zonizamid, I don't know how to, to, to pronounce this in English. Zonizamid works quite well and benzodiazepines work quite well, are well tolerated. And um, Brivaracetam, the, the new one of the following uh, Levitiracetam works very well, but it's just an add-on drug at the moment. It's not um, mono, it's, there, it's not approved for monotherapy. That are those we have very good experience with. You Although there is no specific uh, protocol, we we'll just know the list of the most uh, advisable drugs no. to use. Is that right? Yes, exactly. No specific protocol. No. Okay. And finally, I don't know, Leobo Miri, if you want to ask anything else. Well, you thanks can. a lot. Yes, it was it was uh, very very precisely answered to my question. Thanks, Professor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marit Otto, I think I've, I've unmuted you. I'm going to try. Yes, uh, now you can speak, please. Do you want to, to explain about your patient with a POG mutation and the phenotype Ninji? <laughs> if, if I know, yes, I know. So uh, Marit, uh, as a patient. Yeah. Oh. Well, Marit. It's Go ahead, 18, please. Yeah. It's an 18 year old boy uh, with a mingy uh, like phenotype and with um, gastrointestinal kind of um, symptoms and cachexia and um, total obstruction from general severe um, axonal uh, neuropathy and uh, ataxia. Yeah. And um, it's, it's described in literature, and I just uh, like to ask you, you mentioned some uh, treatment options for. For those in the patient to continue uh, uh, mm. mutation, if there's uh, anything for those. Yeah, that's, so. yeah. Yes, I mean, that is, as far as, I, what, what it differs from the characteristic Minji that it's an axonal neuropathy, as far as I understood. The Minji usually have this demyelinating phenotype. A severe axonal neuropathies are very frequent in, in polk associated disorders. And um, I, as, as I, I, I just um, discussed for the MILAS and the rhabdomyolysis, I have to say there's no specific uh, treatment, no specific uh, cure for uh, no cure and no specific treatment. That's, that's very unfortunate. I have to say that's what is strongly needed in that area. So I cannot give you any advice to, um, that will clearly for sure help these patients. That's, that's a pity that those clinical trials with uh, focusing on myopathy phenotypes are now coming up, but uh, these are all phase two trials and focus on primary myopathy, not on these ataxia neuropathy phenotypes. I exactly know what you, what you mean. These phenotypes are usually very severe. So I'm very sorry. <laughs> last question from Oksana Pogorovieva. Uh, do you have Atroposmy, atroposmy, any other uh, indicator of severity of the disease? Uh, Oksana, you can unmute yourself if you want to explain better than me. Thank you, Antonio. Um, um, thank you very much for the presentation. No, I was just wondering, it, just because in one family with the same mutation, the phenotype or manifestation can vary qu quite a lot. So is there anything that can help us to predict who is going to manifest in a more severe manner? Yeah, and I, I, there, there are uh, some papers on different factors that really uh, depends on, 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 the, on the underlying mutation, on the phenotype. Um, as far as I know, there's no very reliable factors that, that predict the, the or, or indicate the prognosis. There have been a lot of attempts and ideas, but usually this is based on, on some specific patient cohorts and so on. And it's um, in, in, the, in the long run, it, 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 there are different impressions and so on. So I, I, I cannot give you any clear prognostic markers or so um, for, 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 for the, the clinical cause of the disease. I'm, I'm sorry, that at least according to my experience. 
we have some families here that is really very, very strange with the uh, ATP6 uh, uh, um, mutations or NAP mutations, where all these uh, things that are very well known, and, and especially these uh, mutations, there is, is, it is said that there's a quite good uh, genotype phenotype correlation um, with the mutation load correlating with the phenotype. It, it does, it's not true in, in those patients we here see. And the same is for MRF, where we see very, very yeah. strange <laughs> phenotypes. <Yeah. laughs> I have to say, this very high mutation loads being asymptomatic or so on. And so yeah, true, but, true. That this is why I was asking. <laughs> I mean, I said it's really, really strange. And we have perhaps these mitochondrial biomarkers, but I'm, we, we are just going to, we, I'm, I'm testing it now. They are really high, severely increased in, 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 the, in the primary mitochondrial DNA mutations, but there's no, I, it's, it's much too early to say if it works as a predictor or so. Thank you. Okay. I think that we, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, we don't have time for my more questions. Antonio, very shortly, what might be a, perhaps a bit of a predictor is if the, the, the uh, retina is involved. If you see these retinopathies, these phenotypes are usually more severe. There are some papers on that, as far as I know, and it's our experience, but it's just an observation. Okay, so uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Cornelia. I think this was a rather uh, instructive hour for everybody. I think that you gave us a very good brush of the of the clinics, and that will help us definitely uh, in dealing with these patients. And I hope to soon have you back in our in the webinar series. And thank you very much for participating in my in Elizabeth's and my name and I think of all the attendants. Okay, so bye now. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank Hello, you. thanks to the organizers. Thanks.